let me on behalf of ibpc welcome the panelists and welcome all of you to this webinar on cash flow management uh it's not just cash flow management during lockdown times but during times of any crisis of this nature uh and generally uh, i think cash is king or you know cash on hand is better than two in the bank are all clichés which are always relevant uh, in businesses and uh, more businesses have failed because they couldn't manage their cash flow than those that failed because their profitability was not uh, sufficient uh, or not there so i think it's a very important subject um it's uh, part of uh, a series of webinars that we have been having and i'm happy to say that uh, i think we had 144 members joining in uh, and the number is growing because some are still joining as we speak um what i would like to share with the members in particular is that our policy advocacy measures have started to yield fruits in terms of uh, policy actions by the governmental authorities by the various government agencies uh, uh even yesterday i had a discussion with the dubai chamber and uh, so we we can expect some good news uh, in the next few uh, days weeks and try in terms of vat deferment and so on as i would say uh, as you know uh, is generally said watch the space is the uh, is the message uh, clearly um, our expectations need to be reasonable because uh, you know the difficult time is a difficult time loss of production loss of business is something that we all share including the various uh, governments of the day and therefore any expectations that we have must be reasonable we are doing a survey shortly you will receive um for each of the focus groups each of the sectors in terms of wanting the members to specify what it is that we can further advocate with the various authorities again the watch word is reasonableness in terms of requirements and expectations so with that uh, i would now pass over the mic to ramesh and ramesh it's over to you to convene thank you mr chairman a very warm welcome to all our fellow ibpc members and invitees who have joined us at this webinar and a special welcome to our panelists he if no one else does he does epitomize the indo uae fdi story he's invested more than 500 million dollars in india believe it or not and uh, he has been instrumental in the paypal ipo among other things when he was with adia he is actively involved in all phases of the evolvents group which he founded 20 years ago and focuses his efforts on strategic direction business development and investor and regulatory issues he has extensive capital raising and investment experience and hold and holds board mandates on various group initiatives his uh, businesses cover education healthcare his investments cover healthcare and consumer goods to name a few khalid we would be delighted if you could uh, to give it the opening remarks on uh, the the covid in general and business here and cash flow in particular what you can Thank you thank you so much Ramesh and thank you for having me it's a pleasure to have uh, to be uh, to be addressing such a prominent part of our community panel and members and so forth um you know it's it's an, it's it's quite interesting times but uh, as you can know I'm exposed to all the sectors in if it was education retail hospitality restaurants real estate banking and um trust me sleepless nights in terms of that but uh, you know um in terms of cash flow um 
I think right now it's it's really coming to a micromanagement style, unfortunately, where you really get to know where every dirham is going. So uh, I recommend that, yes, it's a burden, but you really need to do micro, micromanage. Every dirham that goes out of your bank account, you will, you, you will have to approve it. And the reason I'm saying this is, is trust me on the aspect that the banks will take this as a favorable when they speak to you and later on to help you and support you, they will, they will look at how much has this founder or CEO or CFO has been involved in the cash flow. Now, some people have also been using this excuse not to pay, which are also, you know, we will discuss this today on the panel, but um, I have been investing in India since 2003, 2004. I've made money there. I think I'm one of the few that has made, has stayed there. Right? And, um, you know, we have an exposure to companies like Big Basket and so forth. So India has been extremely, extremely profitable business for me. And thank God. And, um, and we have the businesses in Dubai also that are extremely well. In general, in general, what we, the way we're going through this tunnel, the way we will come out of this tunnel is completely two different ways. In Dubai, we, had, we used to have a saying, we have India's margin, but we have Dubai's volume. So now that is one of the things, special things about Dubai, and, the, and, the, and, and it also reflects our cash flow management style. So micromanage is the name of the game right now. No one, Thank don't you. be ashamed of it, and so forth. So Ramesh, this is, this is some in, in, a, in, a, in a very short period uh, answer for you. Thank you, Khaled. We'll come back to you with some specific questions just a few minutes down the road. I now turn to our next panelist, um, Mr. Krishnamurti. He is the group COO of Dubai Investments, PJSC. He's been there since uh, September 2015. Krishnamurti and I go back a dozen years at least. Now, he is uh, the non-executive chairman of the Singapore Business Council. And we hope we can have a joint session someday with you, Krish, as business councils go. Krishna's uh, previous employments include Group CFO of Abu Dhabi Capital Group, which is a multi-billion uh, family office uh, from Abu Dhabi. He was earlier the Group CFO of DR. And uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, in the audience, uh, there is an INSEAD case study on him and his CFO uh, and his CEO, Marcus Jibel how they turned DR around. So he has a case study to his credit. He earlier worked in uh, IKEA in Singapore. And so uh, he has varied experience across countries. Krish, we'd like to hear from you in uh, a couple of minutes as to what your opening remarks are regarding this crisis and how we're navigating it. Yeah. Over to you. Uh, th thank you, Ramesh, and thank you, everybody, for giving me an opportunity to uh, come and uh, share my experiences as well as wh what exactly we are doing as a group with Dubai Investments and uh, share my thought process. I think, I, I think well, let me start with uh, a very famous song that I've been always listening to when the, by Michael Bolton saying, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And this is incredibly very, very tough times for all of us, uh, not only the region, across the globe. Uh, I think uh, our biggest lessons, I think, one we can learn is how this is basically coming back to uh, financial discipline. Uh, uh, right from the start, how do we manage our cash flows? How do we protect our businesses? And uh, well, what is the game plan and how do we carry it across? Across the group, I think we did a complete business contingency plan and uh, we have identified six major uh, uh, action plan. One is to kind of recognize, yes, there's a big problem. Two, put up a senior management team in plain place to say, guys, here is it. I think the, for the, I think the most important thing for me was the, the safety of the people around us. How do we safeguard them? That was point number three. Then the fourth one is basically coming back and saying that uh, oh, what are the, uh, how do we manage the cash flows? If it is a uh, zero business situation for the next three months, next two quarters, how do we manage it? And uh, the fifth one was basically to say what, what kind of uh, 
uh, initiatives we can take as a, as a group to kind of minimize the cash outflows, defer the payment of uh, certain receivable payables, and what can we kind of uh, do in terms of inventory planning. And, six, and the sixth one is basically to also to kind of give back to the lot of government and banks who are going to help us out in terms of uh, difficult times. For us, is also a show a bit of appreciation back to them. And when the business recovers and we are in a uh, position of uh, strength, I think it is also sh to show our goodwill back to the financial institutions and various government agencies to say a big thank you for them. I think thank you, Chris. Great. Chris, we'll come back to you with uh, some more very pointed, specific questions. We now turn to our third panelist, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Agarwala. He is the Group Chief Operating Officer of uh, Al Habtur Group. He is a member of the uh, Group's Executive Committee and a board member of uh, the Al Habtur Group's Hospitality, Real Estate, Education, Car Leasing, and Audit Divisions. Managing a multi billion dollar real estate portfolio comprising 2,000 luxury lifestyle residential units in the UAE and over 700,000 square feet of commercial and retail space in the Emirates and abroad, he has his hands full. He started his career at ITC in India and later worked for Sarova Hotels in Kenya. He's an industry veteran with over 30 years of experience. His core strengths <clears throat> include fundraising in equity and debt markets, private equity, investments, derivatives, and M&A. Now, we'd like to hear from you, Sanjeev, on your views on the COVID and how you're navigating it. Yeah. A couple of minutes of introductory remarks, and then we move on. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh, and uh, thank you, friends from IBPC. It is an honor to speak, uh, although I can't see the 100 plus participants, but I can track their names on my screen. Indeed, we are in difficult times, absolutely unprecedented. And as the earlier panelists have mentioned, it is a time to look inside, look deep, look micro. Before that, what I do in Al Habtur is basically we have three large pillars or stream the main core pillars, which is the hospitality arm, the real estate, and the automotives. We distribute Mitsubishi, Bugatti, Bentley, McLaren, and we have seven hotels in Dubai and seven internationally. And we have schools in Emirates International School and a large car leasing company called Diamond Lease. In these times, yes, the famous buzzword is cash flows cash flows and cash flows. And everyone has asked or is doing the obvious look deep inside and micromanage, right thing to do. I add on that, we just don't have to look inside, we have to look around us and look 360. It's just not about the business. This is now also about people. People in the business, people in your own organization, people who are your suppliers, your chains, and above all, your family and friends. It has become such a state as we speak that we have drawn what we call in Hindi a Lakshman Rekha around our house. To manage that, trust me, it's not very easy. But this is the times when the character, the resilience, the strength of each individual is tested. When we get to specifics, we will discuss how we do manage cash flows, what good or best practices we have adopted, not only in businesses, but also in the social and the cultural activities that we are currently doing. Ramesh, without further ado, I would Thank like you. you to introduce Anando Bengali Babu. Thank you, uh, Sanjeev, appreciate. Now we turn to Shunando Mukhopadhyay, a seasoned banker with over three decades of experience, much of it gained in Standard Chartered Bank. He was most recently with Noor Bank. And I have to share something with you, uh, members of the audience. When I asked a couple of bankers uh, if, uh, if they would join the panel, they were not able to get permission to do so. Their respective banks would not let them uh, give them permission to come and speak at a public forum for whatever reasons best known to them. 
Shunando was until recently with Noor Bank and is now between jobs. And so he was sporting and game enough to say, yes, I will come and speak at your panel. And Shunando, we would like to hear from you, your views, please, on the COVID and how you see us navigating. And then we'll go over to the specific curated questions. Yeah. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure and privilege to be on the panel. And I'd like to thank Ramesh, the management of IBPC, and the members of IBPC for giving me the opportunity to be here. I will not take much time, but all that I would like to say is the situation right now is unprecedented. We started with a, with a soft beginning in November. And from November until April, we have things rapid. We have seen rapid changes to the current situation. Uh, ever since WHO announced or pronounced that this has become a pandemic, it, is, it has been absolute mayhem. This is the time when I personally believe that each business has to be in very strong integrated dialogue with your bankers among all your stakeholders to come through with transparency on both sides uh, about the bank's actions or what they are planning to do and about yourselves as you, as you navigate through your cash flows and start creating projections around them so that somewhere down the line, the business and the banks come and see and, and meet at a common point. Uh, the understanding between the two parties is extremely crucial and it will probably create the foundation for the businesses living through this, this crisis. That's all that I would like to say at this stage. Await specific questions. Back to you, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Shinando. Great. Uh, let me now address this question to, uh, to Krishna. Yes, sir. You have seen the 2008 crisis, the 2003 SARS crisis, the Japanese earthquake, and so forth. Uh, we, you probably were in Singapore at the time. Yeah. How might you have brought your earlier experiences to bear in treating or addressing the COVID crisis? I, I think I would relate the COVID crisis to be a slightly very similar to the, the SARS crisis we had in the Asia and Singapore. But again, the SARS crisis was confined, can I say, only to Asia alone. And again, with a com multinational company like IKEA, we did a uh, few things uh, spot on. We, we had, that was a company which is known to have a business contingency plan every year. In fact, we had a business contingency week year on year to say, guys, the world collapses. What do we do? So in fact, it was very funny when people come and say, why are we spending so much of money? Uh, year on year to kind of uh, uh, do this, but uh, it was such a remarkable uh, experience for us to kind of put through those learning sessions to the actual uh, uh, event when it occurred to say, what is that we do? We kind of had to safeguard the, the complete supply chain uh, environment because most of the purchases of IKEA is coming, back, is coming from Asia. I think Asia accounts for almost 50% of the procurement that happens in IKEA. So you're almost, almost talking about almost five to six billion dollars of uh, uh, procurement, which we had to safeguard. And again, IKEA as a company, we had established practices, uh, suppliers. So we went uh, and went about doing things in a meticulous way. First, we had some again a five-point action plan. The first one was how do we safeguard the safety and the health of the employees. Employee safety is always been a predominantly uh, an employee-driven company. So uh, safety and uh, safety of the employees was was addressed first. Secondly, is going back to uh, how do we address the supply chain, right from the production to the uh, distribution to the retail. So the, every aspect was kind of handled in a in a manner and, uh, and with the established bankers we had in place globally, it was helpful uh, in a way to elevate the situation. So uh, I think that learning coming into place here, we are trying to uh, uh, but bring the best practices of what IKEA did uh, globally here to this part of the region. And having said that, we are addressing it in a very, very similar fashion, correct? First, we recognize there is a problem. 
then we are putting a senior management team in place. Third, we have a safety uh, network for the employees. Fourth, then we address the business issues. How do we address the business issues? In just, we have a short-term plan for the next three months cash flow, the next six months cash flow, and then we have a cash flow plan that is running up to the end of the year. And then we have divided on, uh, we've, we've worked on scenarios. If you have a zero revenue situation, what is your cash flow impact? If you have a 50% drop in revenue, what is your cash flow impact? So we've kind of worked on various scenarios. And we've kind of had the, come to a situation where are the cash flow gaps that we might come across with that zero, zero, we are at zero revenue and 50% revenue. Having addressed that, now we know uh, where the gaps are going to be. Then we came back and said, what is that as an initiative, what is that we can take to kind of reduce the gaps? One is again, fiscal, deficient, uh, fiscal discipline, two, micromanagement, line by line item of uh, uh, expense management, Three, again, requesting the banks for deferment of uh, loans for a period of time until such time our business visibility of business is happening. Then going back to government agencies and the others to seek support in terms of rent waiver, in terms of uh, uh, reduction in the fees. Yeah, and uh, these are uh, testing times, but we're getting there. We're slowly getting there. I think but we all recognize there is a problem and uh, we are getting the whole ecosystem together. Very well, very well. Great. Would Khaled like to weigh on this uh, aspect uh, about, of, of recycling old experiences and bringing them to handle this current one? Well, I, I think uh, since the first crisis I was exposed to was uh, the Asian crisis in Adia, and I was probably the only one that was panicking in Abu Dhabi. Probably everyone else had no clue what was going on in Asia in 97, 98. But again, similar, similar to what my colleague here on the panel said, micromanaging is, is, is a, an important aspect to really, really get to know the business. The second thing, please don't be shy to ask even government entities for a payment plan. Don't be shy, everyone. Don't be shy, no matter if it's a government, semi-government, we are all on this in the same boat no one is no one is leaving this boat we're all on the same boat so just tell everyone that please delay this payment delay if it was semi-government gre fully government everyone will understand no one will go, go, going to pick on you or so forth so so for all the members of this um, we have in the education side uh, took case by case we 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 reduced we reduced the only thing that you know, we cannot budget is, is one aspect which is really a risk aspect, which is what percentage of the population will leave when the, when, when the airports open up. We will have a shrinkage in the economy. So we, will, we have to also address this. So, so as my colleague said, we take that scenario into effect that we will have minus 10, minus 20, minus 30% of the population. So that is, I think, a very important um, aspect but but most lo mostly please i would say and i will say it very strongly don't be shy asking every government entity for a discount waiver delay defer payments so that's ramesh my answer to that, my ear. thank you that's a great tip for all our members Khalid. Uh, it's, a, it's a big takeaway for the day yeah um i'd like to now uh turn to sunando and ask him this question uh, to help cushion the uh, COVID impacts, the UAE Central Bank launched a 250 billion dirham stimulus package last month. They call it TESS, short for Targeted Economic Support System. And they've already disbursed some 50 plus 10, 60 billion, according to the papers, yeah, for SMEs and retail customers. Now, how much of it, Shonando, and in what form do you see these amounts translating into actual assistance to the borrowers themselves? Thank you, Ramesh. Um, so, uh, again, uh, I'd just like to go back to previous crisis and the, uh, the one prior to that. Mm -hmm. And then there was a local crisis in between, which was not so crisis sort of thing, but it was more SME driven. And we have all realized that agility to react to the situation is of primary importance 
And this time, Central Bank of the UAE has been spot on. They have come up with a, a package of 256 billion dirhams, which is $70 billion. And uh, it, it, it's a fair amount because if you see the customer loans in the UAE are to the tune of about 1.7 trillion dirhams, 1.6, 1.7 trillion dirhams. So it does represent a fairly large chunk. And the way it has been handled is the 256 is broken down into four parts. And it's basically realignment of the balance sheets for various, for on your asset side for the banks. Well, the fact of the matter is at least 100 billion is available for directly supporting SMEs and corporates through funds that are being made available from the central bank. There should be absolutely no issues in SMEs and corporates walking up to the bank and asking for this because the banks would have already started uh, dealing with this issue probably in January. They would have perhaps already gone and resegmented their uh, loan portfolio by what we call it as a fire drill. The portfolio would have been segmented into a red and amber and green zones and various companies will fall into these categories depending on what the bank, that's the business and the credit risk together, consider as vulnerable uh, to the to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So uh, there will, the green zone will perhaps this time be a little smaller so that a lesser number of entities, amber will be a very large chunk. So the, the sooner companies get to react and reach out to their bankers for additional limits, funds, or restructuring requirements, if you've already come to yeah. uh, a conclusion that you do need restructuring, mm -hmm. is, is better. But the banks have also got to see that uh, Central Bank has also given various other, it's not just this 100 billion, but a fair, fair number of other uh, levers as well to play with. They've cut down on interest rates. Uh, it, it, yes. it's, it's followed the US interest rate scenario. They've reduced, uh, they've, they've increased the mortgage LTVs by 5%. So uh, more and more funds are where being made, made available uh, directly through the banks. Uh, they have also allowed uh, real estate sector lending to grow to 30%. From the prior stipulated 20%, so that should be should play well. Or a, a fair number of fee reduction scenarios are available to individuals, and uh, you know uh, SMEs always have uh, the right to move up to the banks and ask for favors. So yeah, that's what I think that uh, uh, companies should be doing right now. Very well, very well. Uh, pick, taking up on that, let me try and put you on the spot a bit, uh, Sunando. <laughs> uh, in the course of interacting with businessmen, that is clients and friends, I've been hearing that uh, when they ask their banker for an approval, say for a limit excess or, or uh, on their OD or whatever, it's taking longer these days than it used to pre-COVID. Why might this be the case if so much of facilities are being made available. Uh, okay, uh, that's um, well. It, it, it's a commonplace issue, really. I'm not surprised with this, but uh, let let me answer that in in the form that the situation is not business as usual, Ramesh. Uh, during business as usual, a 24-hour turnaround would be a banker's uh, delight and and to the delight of the customers. Let's understand that banks currently are operating at a suboptimal workforce. Majority of the bankers are working from home. And you know what? Although we give a lot of digital enablers to our customers, bankers are not really that well digitized. So the documentation requirements for a, for a trade document still remain. Yeah. And uh, so uh, that's one aspect. You know, branches are operating at a much shorter working hours. Uh, so Transguard and uh, Group 4 Securitas are having to probably, uh, you know, double up their capacity to load ATMs 
and and reach cash to the, the requisite businesses. The other thing that so that's one aspect the the capacity and uh, you know how soon does a banker be able to produce pro process a transaction. The second thing is I just like to draw upon what I said earlier that. Most businesses by now would have been, or most customers would have by now been either graded a green or an amber or a red. So companies that, and, and this is on the basis of the banker's hypothesis of the vulnerability of cash flows, balance sheet, and you know demand and supply of what they are dealing in. Now, companies that are in the green zone will probably not complain about transaction processing. They'll have it done pretty soon. Companies that are facing the difficulties that, you know, there, there can be two answers. One, nothing is happening, in which case you can be almost sure that it has gone into the red zone and it's time to get to the banker's doorstep asking what's going on. The second or the, the larger population of corporates that I think uh, will be there is the amber zone where there is a constructive dialogue probably going on now between the front line and credit as to whether transactions should be done or not. Yeah, so you know, the, the fund, funding is limited. It's not as if unlimited funds are available and banks will want to safeguard their lending. So yeah, you, I, I, I don't think this problem is going to go away soon, but the sooner that you get to know where you are uh, to the extent possible, is better for you. Very well, very well. Let me ask Shunando, uh, sorry, let me ask Sanjeev how he navigates his bankers to get his uh, way with them uh, at an early clip. Look, uh, let me let me start with the caveat. Representing a private family office, I have a liberty to say certain things and certain things I am not at liberty to speak about. Sure, within the remit that you're... Within the remit and within the experience and within the business best practice, I will make an answer which should help the audience as well. Now, managing bankers is not you wake up one day and say, let me start managing a banker. <laughs> Banking is a relationship that is developed over years. It's like you just can't get up one day and say, I found a girlfriend today and I go to Spinney's, I found somebody. It rarely happens like that. Therefore, there are two aspects to such, uh, what shall I say, relationships. One is time and trust. Trust builds over many years. And definitely how you have been managing your business risks over the last not one year or two years, but perhaps the last 10, 15, 20 years. What happens now is even if your business is vulnerable, as Sanando said, let's take the example of hospitality, which we are in. Now, everything is shut. All hotels are shut and we are no exception. Does that mean uh, the hospitality industry or the businessmen or owners in charge of hospitality industry should go declare themselves bankrupt? <laughs> is it that banks will say, oh, there is no hope in the hospitality industry or the airline industry or the FNB businesses around Dubai, which has, I think, more than 68,000 restaurants. So they should be all declared bankrupt. And thank you very much. No, it doesn't work. The bankers... Fortunately, fortunately, and particularly in UAE, are a smart bunch of people. And when I say smart, I don't mean sarcasm. I mean they are matured. UAE Central Bank perhaps was the first central bank around the world which understood the problem or the situation, as I would rephrase it, and came back with some quite decent, I would say very decent SOPs. They were very first to recognize. None of the banks want to take over a real estate yeah, building yeah. and say, okay, let me declare bank, let me take the building which has been mortgaged. What will they do? Will they do better than the owner of the building or the developer? 
they can't. So, in my short answer to this situation is, this is a time, yes, there will be red, amber, green, blue, black, orange, but there will be a true level of partnerships. Very well. I don't believe, I'm talking about the big names. I'm not talking about very small, you know, very, very tiny businesses. Yes, they will really, really feel the crunch at this point of time. But generally, across the board, there will be a mutual feeling of partnership. There will be a feeling of live and let live. The bankers have no choice but to allow businesses run by the owners themselves and, and uh, let's say, wait for a bit of sunshine to arrive where things can get back to normal. Great, great. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's the relationship that sees you through these difficult times. Yeah? And, and past experiences. What have and you been past. doing? How risk averse were you during your the conduct, conduct. conduct of the account, your uh, credibility built? Now, let me turn to Khalid and ask him a question which I will ask around the panel. Has uh, the cash flow situation, Khalid, caused you to rethink your fundamental business strategy or any part of your business strategy? Yes, of course. Um, you know, um, that has me, you know, all the other plans and probably put on hold. I think also fighting for market share is a fundamental um, you know, reason if it was in different businesses we're in, but to to protect that uh, to protect that market share you have, I think I think one of the most important things, Ramesh, when coming back to also the the cash flow, and which I uh, uh, recommend to all the other uh, you know colleagues here, is that when we present cash flow projections to banks, we go from the from this what they would like to hear to what we can afford. There's two different scenarios that we need to get reality. Uh, they will always go back to mismatch asset liabilities, short term. No, this is the time where we say, where we have to put your foot down and say, interest only for the first two, three years, very much EBOR plus small margin so that you can survive and so forth and get overdraft. So this is a very fundamental thing that everyone should ask the bankers from. What I can afford, not what you can afford. So this is, this is a very important thing. And also sectors like hospitality. Hotels will open back. What, what are you going to do? Restructure me and ask me to pay. give me a grace period like it was under construction. Go back to businesses that you capitalize the interest, like you restructure the loan, and one year, one and a half years, you capitalize the interest so that in one and a half years, when things go back, you go, you, uh, uh, you go back to paying and things smooth. But just make sure you ask for these things from the bankers so that we can get over this hurdles that we're facing right now. Without being shy, if I may. Without being shy. Absolutely. Yeah. Please, everyone, do not think, everyone, do not think to be shy and put your foot down and say, this is, this is what we need to survive. Bravo, bravo. Can uh, Krishna weigh in on this uh, aspect of uh, how and in what manner might strategy have been uh, impacted or changed by the cash flow scenario? I think, I think what we have also done is basically it also helps. I think one thing helps us at Dubai Investment is we are a public listed company. To our management and shareholders have been very, very supportive. Have been, we have been there for 20 years. We have also been known as a company for a very good financial discipline. All our businesses are done with a kind of uh, a military-like discipline. I think that helps us in very, very tough times. And uh, during this uh, COVID situation, which we are facing now, I think what we have also done is we are deferring all the important major projects that's coming on, which has been approved by the board. There is potentially that we will defer some projects. All of our uh, CapEx plans are being uh, uh, deferred. Three, as we speak, we are also seeking uh, uh, working capital facilities, extension of the term loans. But what we also did as a group, which helped us, is basically we also had, we, there is one fundamental learning we all did 
actually, which I learned it in Singapore, I can share it. You raise finances from a bank when you don't need it. When your balance sheet is strong, you raise finances and you keep Perfect. the credit limits with you. And obviously, there is a price which you pay for it. And I think that for me is a liquidity premium. Someone has to kind of uh, put, it, uh, put it on the books. And that helps in terms of situations like this. And again, a company like a big company like us, it helps when uh, a principal shareholder or the holding company provides us a corporate guarantee to, uh, which helps us out for additional credit limits from the bank. Uh, I think that this is the way we're doing it. And the way I think what we have also did is what is extreme cases we did cash flows. Correct. If the rev if your revenue is at zero or uh, uh, if no revenue happens, what is your cash flow gap? So at fifty percent revenue streams, what is your cash flow gap? And at seventy five percent. So when you've identified the the revenue streams and the cash flow gaps at each situation, then you also go back to the bank and say, these are the three situations we are looking at, and two. These are the measures and initiatives that we have taken as a group to kind of overcome this crisis. And then we are seeking help from the bank to also be fair to the bank. I think it is also imperative that we also discipline ourselves in, ma the, in managing the cash flows. And I think, I think as a group, I think we are sending the right signals to the bank. Super. I'll ha I have one more question before we open the uh, floor to the uh, questions from uh, the audience. And uh, my question is, is, is really... When COVID is behind us, finally, whenever that is, what lesson or lessons might the business community have learned from this entire episode? Yeah. Would uh, uh, Sanjeev uh, comment on this? Not one lesson. I think there'll be 500 lessons. Uh, the the top two, if you like. Top two, I know. You know, I'm really... Um, I would look into the eye of many of my directors or, uh, uh, you know, revenue, the people in charge of business development, you know, picking up some small issues. Oh, we have to travel everywhere for business meetings. We have to travel to all the conferences. We have to be on the flight at least five days in a month or sometimes 10 days in a month. Now, suddenly all that has disappeared. And business, you know, is as good like IBPC, ICAI, all the seminars that we had to drive to God knows all the hotels in Dubai and we had to wait, sit, parking and now trust me, it hasn't stopped. I think IBPC and ICAI had taken the lead with uh, so-called digital learning. So there are so many issues, even in terms of managing accounting, managing, you know, what I would say to be the top part is the business continuity. What you mean this, cut, cut, the, cut the flap, basically. Cut yeah? the flap and it is translating into so much of things, trust me. You know, all over the world, it's just been a new standard of how to approach business. Business continuity, it has taught us how to, you know, to do business when we are in true stress. Even office meetings, we could not meet. And we, have, we had thousands of meetings in a week. Now, suddenly the meetings have disappeared. The meetings have come online. It has become a wonderful, I mean, whatever, you know, like they say, the positivity in this adversity. Great. There are many business lessons we are taking from here. Thank you. Let me turn over to Khalid to hear what lessons he thinks we, the business community might earn. Oh, the, <laughs> oh this, 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 this has been probably one of the toughest class in humanity, you know, um, but I will say one thing, uh, you know, as a human nature and as a human, if, you know, you have to look at the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think, and I just want to share something that has been shared with me today in the morning is, is how much, how much probably this will hurt China and how much in terms of business. So everyone is going to, everyone was going to look at somewhere else. And one of the most beautiful places we have all built together here is Dubai. So look at it is that we're not going to be suffering for a long time because we built something that is friendly to others to come and live with us. So cash flow, yes, we will suffer. We will, we will, we will definitely suffer for some time. But we've built something as a platform that others can come and build with us. So I hope we will get a V-shape recovery. But there are sectors that will not. But that's the name of the game, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, there are obviously um, several more lessons that you have in mind. Uh, 
in the interest of time, uh, if you don't mind, I'll get over to the questions. Uh, our audience has been firing away on all four cylinders. Yeah. Um, first question comes from Mr. Ram, A. R. Ram. My question to Mr. Krishnamurti. In the UAE context, large corporates and government entities are often seen using their small suppliers as a source of free financing, stretching out payment terms to manage their own cash flows to the detriment of small vendors and often resulting in a cycle of cash shortage in the system. Don't you think the government here has a key role to play in releasing payments as per agreed terms and bringing in regulations to that effect? According to me, regulatory in initiative have a huge role to play in these situations. Yeah, I completely, I think the bank should uh, support the SME sector in many ways. This is where the extension of uh, uh, credit during these difficult times comes into play. One is, uh, uh, I mean, if uh, the small vendors know uh, the, who the, the uh, customer risk is, uh, if, if the vendors are supplying to big corporates like Dubai Investments and all that, the government can, or the bankers can come in and take a risk to say the end customer is a, uh, is a, is a, uh, is a party, they can kind of live with it and they can go and finance all the SMEs. I think uh, the banks have to come back and give them special, specific lines of credit during possibly, I would say, next three months, six months, until such time there is visibility that the businesses are opening up and, and even possibly to an extent some kind of uh, collateral guarantees that will help them to support the businesses. I think that, that way I can also speak for Singapore. Singapore also opening up lines of credit. The government is giving up guarantees uh, to small customers, to all Singaporean companies that has been established. I think on similar lines, I think the government is doing it. The UAE government has come out in a big way to support the SMEs. It is them. They need to go and approach the banks and, and kind of uh, give, be, I think the way I think uh, they should do it is I think they need to be more transparent to the banks to say, guys, six, three months is going to be difficult times. And once the difficult time passes, they have a sound business model that they can move by, move on. And that will give them a bit of reassurance to the bank. It should not be a one way traffic for me. I completely uh, also sympathize with the bankers during this difficult times for them to kind of write out checks and, and once the business improves, they, uh, they go to a different bank to operate with. I think that, that's different. But I think the way I would see it is, I think stay with the bank and the banks will, uh, and if you have a good business plan, the banks will support you. And the government is doing everything there to support the businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ganesh Venkatraman writes, it's, I think it's a rhetorical question here. It says, what happens to companies which don't have bank facilities? Who do they approach now? Shananda, do you want to give uh, a short answer to this one? Yeah, this, is a, this is a tough one, Ramesh. You know, <laughs> we heard a little while ago that if you've got credibility established with your bankers in the past and you've been able to demonstrate the credibility of your cash flows and your business plans and you've done that over a decade, you can hardly imagine that a banker will stand up and say, you know what, you step aside. My existing clients are well-placed. Let me lend whatever I have in my kitty to new to bank clients. That's probably a tough ask. But again, Central Bank has actually, if you, if you read between the lines, they have set out a certain amount of funds purely for SMEs and for support of SMEs. And this is the time probably, if you have had a business that has performed well over the last three years, four years, and you are in need of working capital or a term finance that you, you're probably in the process of buying machines or something using your own cash flows. This is the time probably you can start small with a bank. And there will be a lot of, there are a lot of SME focused banks still in the market mm. who will be able to help you out. It's not the end of the road for uh, small and medium enterprises. Very well, very well. Which brings me to the point, a CFO friend of mine says, Going by the 2008 financial crisis, what he did is the first day he realized that COVID crisis is upon us, he went and drew down all his lines from all his banks. He's a CFO of a listed entity. And now he's sitting pretty. When I ask him cash flow problem, he says, what cash flow problem? I'm sitting with uh, balances <laughs> in my accounts. Okay, so what is one man's meat is another man's poison. He would have yeah. actually drawn down uh, capital what? significantly. And right. Uh, yeah. right. 
So Mr. Sahasranam asks a question, and I think this one would be most appropriate for Sanjeev because it's got to do with automobiles. One of the primary concerns across the industries would be that of inventory pileup. This would be very high in some cases, say automobiles. What could be a solution which can be both liquidity and balance sheet friendly? Is there such a solution? Uh, let me give you a practical solution. I mean, again, it might work for one, it might not work for others. But at this point of time, today, a lot of businesses are going very low on CAPEX. To be specific, many companies are not buying new cars. However, they are leasing cars. And we see a trend. Not that there is a exponential jump, but the leasing business in cars have increased. There is a risk, of course, but then the business of selling cars has shifted to leasing cars. So my recommendation to my friend would be try leasing cars. There is a market for it and that helps in liquidity. You can get some cash, not the full cash of the cars, but at least it'll help to turn the wheels around. Very well. Thank you. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how long will it take the economy to be back on track? May I, I request Khalid to attempt this, please? <laughs> that's a that's a tough one, Ramesh, for me. <laughs> you know, uh, we we. Crystal I think. Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I think. I think. I hope. And um, there's two two kinds of uh, thoughts here. There, either we go through an L-shaped recovery or we go through a V-shaped recovery. I think um, our leadership wants a V-shaped recovery. So that's why that's why we had a boost. If you look at if you look at the stimulus, our stimulus uh, as a percentage of GDP, it's about close to 22 percent relative to other countries, which were around nine to 10 yeah. percent. Singapore, Singapore has done the most probably, but I hope I hope we will um, by I would say to you by mid June we will be starting to go back to offices hopefully. Uh, and, uh, you know, once September we can open schools, I think October we will probably start having a travel, uh, un, you know, travel to go back to normalize into certain countries that have already, or, you know, passed the COVID. But um, 2021, you know, if there's one thing I've learned about it is... When cheap money is there, recovery becomes quite fast. When you go into recession and inflation is 10 to 12%, 15%, there is no recovery. It takes you a long, long time. But when interest rate, the only thing, gentlemen, on this call, if you look at three months EBOR compared to six months EBOR, you will see that the three months is, is now is, is the highest in terms of, of all of the six months, one year, and it's... It's really short-term money is becoming expensive because the bankers are pricing it in. So hopefully, inshallah, Ramesh, I would, I would hope for a V-recovery, not because, not because of, uh, of being an optimistic person or something, but because of the amount of liquidity being pushed into the system yeah. and interest rate being one of those factors where we will come, hopefully, when EBOR goes back to probably around... Uh, you know, 60 pips, 70 pips, everyone is, is borrowing at one and a half, two percent. That's that's when you get really, really nice recovery into the economy. Inshallah. Inshallah. Staying with you, Khaled, the next question is also for you. It's from James Matthew. As successful entrepreneurs, what is the biggest fear in your mind? And how do you overcome this in the next three to six months? Oh dear. Well, uh, keeping mothers in school is a is a <laughs> is a is a thing. I think I think the biggest fear is is for this uh, probably for the corona to spread more and more into into um, into the to the country where we uh, have a huge issues in the healthcare system. What is a beauty is now that everyone is working together to 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 confine this and to limit its areas. So that's why, gentlemen, if you see that certain areas of Dubai or Abu Dhabi is zoned out, 
it is because you know there is there is issues in those camps. So um, I hope so. I hope so, Ramesh. That's my answer. Yeah, very well. Um, this one is uh, to Krishna. It's from Monica Agarwal. How do you see institutional investment happening in real estate as being a tangible product? In other words, I suppose uh, she means, uh, do you see tangible investments happening in real estate or how do you see it on an institutional scale? I think, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think the crisis has got the asset value. The asset values have dropped. And then if the, if the investment is into real estate portfolio and if believe in the region, and I think, and if you believe it's a long-term investment, the yields are good, the asset values have dropped. And then if you look at it on a cap rates have significantly uh, gone higher because of the fact that the asset values have dropped, I think real estate in the long term uh, uh, would, would be a good bet. Again, which real estate? It could be a real estate, it could be a commercial real estate play, it could be a hospitality real estate play, it could be a healthcare real estate play, or, uh, or it could be a residential real estate play. They need to kind of focus on uh, uh, the, the real estate play where they want to get into, or possibly a similar uh, the industrial park real estate play where you get into tenancy for 20 years, 30 years of long-term real estate play. And I think uh, if, if one can kind of zero down and look at the options and with the investments on the yield, I think that for me is a good option given the fact that this region is the region and uh, possibly it's a growing emerging economy region across uh, GCC and Middle East. And uh, I think the safer bet would be that you uh, come in and invest in real estate in a, in a long term play. You are optimistic in the long term, in a nutshell. Thank you. Yeah, yeah um, the infrastructure is already there. So I yeah. think... Uh, no, one, yeah. no one comes close to this infrastructure. Indeed, indeed. Um, the next one uh, goes to Shunando. I hope you have your bulletproof vest on, Shunando. Gosh. <laughs> it's from Rajesh Agarwal of RKG International. Number one, he says, banks are not extending any additional limits. Rather, they have stopped new lendings. Your response, please. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> like I said uh, earlier, that banks would have by now done their own homework. And if they're not extending any additional credit, that could be that the reason could be as simple as either like uh, Krishna said a little earlier, that their assets or the collateral values would have diminished significantly so that the buffer available to them is no longer available. Now, they will have to use some part of uh, the fiscal stimulus that the central bank has, uh, has made it available to come to the party. Now, for doing that, they'll be prioritizing their customer base. Who needs it most? Who needs it least? And this is where I personally believe that there's room for a dialogue. If you are not being able to do it yourself, I would urge that you employ either a consultant, a management consultant, or an auditor of some credibility with the banks to talk to them and take this matter forward. Because, you know, if you left it at this, it's, it's a disease, right? It is only going to get deeper. Mm. It needs treatment. And treatment has to come in the form of dialogue and projection of cash flows. What you're saying, in other words, is that banks are open to being convinced by, uh, uh, by their borrowers. We've always been. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's heartening to note. His second question is, all financial assistance available, availed by the borrower is being reported to the credit bureau. Will it report in negative scoring? Will it negatively impact the borrower's credit rating in the bureau? Uh, um, okay, so uh, what question. normally happens is there is the central bank's risk bureau database. Yeah. And the moment your loans or repayments go past due, there is a status creation. So there are different statuses. When everything is hunky-dory, it's normal. Then you, the next status, when you have passed the 30 days past due, you get into OLM. And then you get into substandard. Then you get into doubtful, etc. So that remains and that directly feeds into the Etihad Credit Bureau. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. But this is where I am saying that once you have established the, the cash flows 
or what it can do for you, you basically can talk to the banks to extend your maturities. If they agree to extend your maturities, depending on how uh, how credible your cash flow uh, projection or analysis is, then it does not uh, vitiate the score. Oh, okay, that's heartening yeah. to note. So, so essentially, the the takeaway from what you just said is prepare a credible cash flow projection and back it up with strong assumptions, which are tenable assumptions and and therefore defensible in front of the banker. Yeah, and they will banker, be open. Which the banker can buy in. Yeah, they'll be open. Yeah, they'll be open to extensions. Very well, very well. Um, the next question uh, about the UVL recovery has already been answered, uh, Manjit Singh Chhabra. So we move to the next question. Uh, Mr. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, how will a businessman react to a present situation regarding redundancies and reducing salaries of up to 50%? Uh, I'm not sure this question is complete. He's probably typed only half the question. So if you can retype the question, we'll then meanwhile move to the next one. Mr. Jay Lakhani says, my company is SME. We are facing problems for recovering money. Collections. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an ouch question. Would, uh, could we hear from Sanjeev on this, please? Collections. Ramesh uh, Lakhani, uh, Mr. Lakhani, this is now has become unfortunately a bit of a vicious cycle because the soft target is to delay the payments. And unfortunately, this is has become some sort of a culture in this part of the world now. Exacerbated by the COVID crisis, I think the first things which many businesses resorted to is to stop payments. I mean, it's not a healthy practice. Unfortunately, if you are part of, if you've fallen in this you know, cycle, again, things has to be sorted by dialogue. And what we have to understand, there is no 100% in this. Even if you recover 50% at this point of time and defer the rest, I think it's a better idea to negotiate. You will not get 100%. The market, I'm telling you practically the market is bad because everyone has frozen each other's payments, which is a very, very wrong practice. But I think negotiation and recovery of whatever percentage, 50, 60, 70%, I think that's the best way to have the wheel moving. Very well. Let me stay on with you, Sanjeev, because the next one has got to do with uh, contracting. Many developers are likely to defer projects or suspend. This will have a serious impact on contractors and their supply chain. How can they face the banks who are not going to spare them? Now, now this is tough. Because this is like, uh, this is inevitable. Certain businesses will come to a standstill Mm -hmm. with uh, less hope of recovery in the very near or medium term future. So this will be like a standstill. We don't know. It could be for two months, three months. It could be for six months. But here is how, and again, it's a case by case, what happens to which project, which business is in that, which line, is, if it's a hotel project, is it a residential project? Is it a commercial project? Then the, visibility of when it will come back online as of now it's very blurred so yes there will be certain damages as well as collateral damages in certain sectors we don't know how many would that be but definitely it everyone will not come out of this situation smiling there will be some tears as well okay thank you dr himan jitwani writes while local governments have some influence on local banks, the international banks are guided by their own internal credit policy constraints. How do you think they will react with support in this crisis? Now, Shunando, I think you've worked for an international bank and a local bank. You are best suited for this answer, I suppose. Uh, I don't know whether this is Hemant Jetwani from my past life. He used to work yes. for Standard Chartered. Um, so. If it is, 
then uh, I must uh, admit that in the last couple of decades, international banks have, uh, they, they, they're no doubt governed by their group credit policies, etc. But they have taken the necessary steps to localize themselves as well. If you see, HSBC often calls themselves a local bank for an international local bank. Uh, and I don't, I don't uh, don't see uh, the way banks reacted during the 2008 crisis. I think international banks pretty much supported customers the way uh, local banks did. Um, I think the the role was slightly different when it came to the SME crisis. Um, several banks actually uh, reacted in a knee jerk manner. But international banks are pretty much in the party as of now, if you see like local banks. It, yes, they are uh, governed by uh, their uh, group policies, but then policies are policies. Uh, practices often become quite different on the ground. Very well. Um, we have just three more questions. We're running over a bit. Uh, I hope uh, a gentleman on the panel and our members you will uh, uh, stay with us for just a few minutes more. Melvin Cornelio writes, how can we get commercial slash office rental relief for the current up to the next three months from Dubai landlords? I think Khalid may have successfully steered his way through this. This is, this is something that you should ask for. Majid al Fatim came on the retail side, Dubai Holding came out, Miras came out, all of them. So, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of the logic. The, 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 the easiest way is to ask for a waiver and then a compromise on, on the different. Right now, the government has absolutely instructed the court system in RIRA that no checks will be presented to the police. So even if the landlords want to Check, take your money and bounce the check and take it to police. You will not. You will not. There will be no cases against you. So that is that is assured by RIRA and assured by the court system. But the most pleasant way, pleasantly, is we have to go back to rates, to, to the leasing rates that are uh, sufficient and make it attractive. So so you have to go back and negotiate with your landlord as a new lease as a new lease from this term. So that also you take into your consideration your trade license is based on this and so forth. So it doesn't only affect you, it affects your trade license because your trade license is a percentage of your rent. So I recommend that people uh, renegotiate the lease, and, uh, renegotiate their offices leases and start a new lease so that they can go back to they go, go back to, to tomorrow to the DED and other government entities with that news. Thank you. That's practical advice for you. Um, there's a question here, uh, an interesting uh, thinking outside the box. In this tough time, SMEs should go for protection against business interruption and accounts receivable insurance policies or amend their current policies with these protections. Is that something practicable? Um, can we request Krishna for his comments on this? Yeah, I mean, the today none of the insurance companies are uh, uh, backing this claim. So no amount of uh, convincing, I mean, what do I say? I think this uh, COVID uh, case covered under the insurance, the answer is no. I think maybe I think uh, future insurance companies uh, coming out with maybe they should probably uh, take into account we've had several instances we had the SARS issue in Singapore in Asia Pacific then we had this COVID maybe you know one more coming in or you don't want to know this one so I think uh, uh, the insurance company should probably look at it completely differently I, th uh, I think they should probably come with some kind of a settlement to all the major businesses some kind of a goodwill settlement in the form of reduced premiums next year that will help the businesses Mm -hmm. So would they come and uh, compensate businesses for the losses? Possibly not. One way for the insurance companies to come and show their goodwill is, yes, all the businesses have suffered and the insurance company have kind of come and scratched. I mean, they didn't have to pay for all the losses the businesses have suffered. I think one way they can support the businesses to kind of say, guys, there is it. We extend the coverage of uh, uh, with no with zero premiums. Uh, 
uh, in the in the coming years. I think that that will be a good gesture from the insurance right. company. Thank you. That question was from Mr. Saifuddin Diwan. Um, in answer to you, Mr. Diwan, uh, the Wimbledon insured their uh, whole event uh, in response to the SARS crisis some 18 years ago, and this year they have they are collecting. The reported figure is about 200 million dollars in insurance claim for having paid premium throughout these years in between. Yeah, that is foresight, management foresight. Um, another question here is uh, anonymous attendee asks, what are the challenges faced when you receive a force majeure halfway through a project in the oil and gas businesses? Is force majeure clause against COVID effective in the Middle East? Uh, this I must admit is a legal question. I am not sure who among you would have faced this uh, legal issue among the panelists. Not strictly a, a direct cash flow question, but uh, would you want to have a go at it, uh, Krishna or Sanjeev? Have you faced a force majeure situation against COVID? COVID caused force majeure? Or have no. you seen Khalid? Huh? Not really at all. No. So it's and uh, I don't want to speculate on our oil and gas. Right. What sort of uh, contractual conditions are covered under force majeure? I mean, there is obviously a boilerplate, but certain I've seen certain force majeure clauses containing certain you know pandemics not covered. Like force majeure will include like like the China treaty with the U.S., yeah. which has a pandemic clause in it. And that's why, you know, it's become a talk of the talk of the world, the right. free trade between China and US. But in this oil and gas, I am unable to say it has to be very specific to the contracts they have signed. Thank you. Thank you. There is one comment from uh, Vinita Kisani. Um, she talks about the fact that um, there is no business for two, three months for certain SMEs. And uh, here's what she might be looking for. One. Extension of the renewal of the rent from 12 months to 15 months to compensate for these three months of no activity. Two, local sponsors to give a period of three months extension instead of 12 months to 15 months on their sponsorships. Interest on existing loans should be waived for three months. Existing license renewal should be stretched by another three months. She, she thinks businesses can grow if these facilities are provided, that is to say they can survive the onslaught of COVID and grow beyond that. Khaled, would you like to comment on uh, these requests? From a, I, think I, I think these are, these, uh, these are you know, easy requests. I would recommend that she ask for more uh, in these circumstances. <laughs> and uh, and uh, if she has, you know, no one wants to lose just... I, I always say no one wants to lose a tenant. If I give you a 12 months or 15 months, 16 months, no. One, if if she leaves, if she leaves that office, that office will be empty for years to come. So um, I would I would probably uh, recommend uh, to this beloved lady to negotiate harder and double her wish list. I would say. <laughs> okay, I have one. Going out to Shunando. Retrenchments are going to be the order of the day. Lots of people will have to leave the country with tears. They may have unsettled loans and this will lead to many issues. How are the banks going to handle this? Oh, well, uh, retrenchment, as, the, as you know, your end of service benefits are obviously already have a loan your end of service benefits are obviously already assigned to those banks. Um, retrenchments, well, I'm facing, I've already faced one. So, uh, yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, banks will go after the collections and they will probably put uh, a, a sort of block on your end of service benefits being released to you. And what you should do is probably if you're, whoever, whoever is expecting or has already received a notice of retrenchments, uh, retrenchment should engage the bank immediately uh, to work out a solution. Uh, there, could be, there could be many options. You know, they could, they could give you a term finance, provided you're looking for a, for a job. 
I I am not very clear if I heard about expired visas being uh, um, extended until the end of the year. I don't know whether retrenched employees will also get to live in the country until the end of the year. I'm not very mm -hmm. sure of that, but mm -hmm. it's probably something that the government might consider because retrenchments, uh, they're going to be the order of the day unless companies really sit back and uh, talk to individuals, individual employees and work out either temporary or permanent uh, salary revisions uh, downwards. Thank you. So, yeah, Thank you, you should talk to your, your banker immediately. Thank you, Shunando. Here's the final question of the day, ladies and gentlemen. It's from Mr. Adil Buhariwala. He says, we've been hearing about how companies should manage cash flow. Any advice for individuals? May I request? <laughs> <laughs> Shunando, why don't you stay on to answer this question? Yeah, why not? Um, We've been doing that. Uh, several small things to do, really. Um, and your stakeholder management, uh, let's let's call it stakeholder support 101, really. Go back to your uh, dashboard. And, yeah, hold, hold stakeholder on. management. From the, from the individual side, yeah? In yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Every individual has stakeholders as well. Mm -hmm. To start with, your landlord. Yeah. Like Khalid said earlier, engage him. Mm -hmm. in being able to give you a discount mm -hmm. or uh, you know a longer period for you to stay instead of 12 right. months it could be 15 months 18 right. months cut down really go through your credit card bills and bank statements for the last 12 months or so and mm -hmm. find out what have you been spending on most banks offer you actually an analytical page on your credit card spends where yeah. you know how much you have spent on travel entertainment retail spends, etc. Austerity is something that if you take a step towards austerity during this, this period and let the lessons go away when the pandemic dies, it's a loss. Mm. It's a loss. Austerity is, should be here to stay. So look at your, your, your spending habits, etc. and see what you can cut down on. So, well. yeah, uh, your your family is a, is an important stakeholder, um, so engage them as well. Great, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Nando. Dear panelists, you've been really very patient, running over twenty minutes beyond our scheduled time. Really appreciate all your uh, patient uh, responses, and to our audience, there were some questions that really fell outside the remit of this meeting. So I regret if I was not able to take your question and put it to the panel. And in some cases, your questions already were answered previously. Therefore, I had to move on to the next question. With this, I shall sign off with a very big thank you to everyone listening in, tuned in and on the panel and to our chairman and to the office, CB in particular, who has been laboring over this very diligently. I think uh, the best vote of thanks is thank you to all the panelists and to you, Ramesh, uh, for steering it uh, so ably. And I think these were some uh, interesting questions. Uh, um, and the dialogue continues. You know, uh, This is a subject which we can address in a number of ways, uh, uh, also from the banking perspective, from the SME perspective. We have a large segment of SMEs uh, in our membership, as indeed we have some larger enterprises. So uh, thank you once again very much. And uh, until we meet next on the webinar, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you, Ramesh. Until next time. Illa Allah